Wow. Well, what a fabulous festival this is. Um, I really want to begin by giving my heartfelt thanks to the organisers for inviting me along. I've learned a huge amount tonight, and uh, I really think that this sort of festival is what every university in the country should be doing. Uh, sharing that knowledge with the community that supports the university, stimulating people, engaging kids who are perhaps uh, too young to come to university yet. It's the essence of excellence, I think, so um, I, I just, uh, it's a wonderful night. What I'm going to talk about this evening is not a piece of research that I've done, but the result of quite a lot of thinking I've done over the last decade about how we might deal with some of the biggest problems, environmental problems particularly, facing us as a species. And what I've found is that there are some technologies that are what I'd call multipotent. They're technologies and approaches that allow us to solve more than one problem at once. So that's what I'm going to be concentrating on tonight, sunlight and seaweed. But I've got to begin by going back to the beginning and, and looking at the nature of the problems we face. One of the very largest of those problems is the climate problem, the fact that we've put a large amount, a large volume of uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that are affecting every ecosystem on the planet and affecting, really, if you want, the metabolism of the planet. And some of the impacts that you've heard about tonight, including endangered species, uh, including fire risk, are involved in intimate ways and are exacerbated by climate change. Scientists, in just earlier this year, have come up with a, a way of mathematically expressing the impact we're having on the planet now. They've, they call it the Anthropocene equation. You can see on one side there the equation tells you about the factors that have determined conditions on the surface of the planet for the last four billion years. On the other side, for the last 40 years, there's a different equation with us at the centre of that equation. And we are now driving some aspects of the Earth system, including its climate, at 170 times the rate of those natural, those natural factors. So we've, we are very large in terms of our impact on the planet now, and uh, I think we need to start acting um, responsibly. So to give you a bit more of a sense of the scale of the problem we face in terms of climate change, this little piece of artwork was done by a, a Melbourne-based artist called Steve Halley. Um, he, um, in this particular piece of art, which is a digital artwork, he has tried to express the volume of oil that is extracted from Earth's crust every second of every minute of every hour of every day. So those barrels of oil there represent one second's worth of extraction. So if you, if you add to that the coal and the natural gas that we're extracting from the Earth's crust, you can see that we have a very large problem. So I'll just go back. <clears throat> In round figures, if you sum all of that up, sum all of the human impacts, the greenhouse gases together, you get a figure of around 50 gigatons of uh, CO2 equivalent going up into the atmosphere every year. That's a number that is really, it's so large, it, we, we, we have difficulty, I think, coming to terms with it. One way of thinking about it is, how many people would you need to put into the atmosphere to make up 50 gigatons? Turns out you'd need to put the human population of Earth into the atmosphere twice over to even approach that number. So there are large transfers of material from the Earth's crust, uh, the greenhouse gases, going into the atmosphere, changing the balance of gases in the atmosphere. And that is having impacts right across the planet. I just wanted to show one slide, because I figured there was probably going to be some young people in the audience of some cute animals that are uh, endangered by climate change. These are two tree kangaroos. In a previous life, um, as you heard, I was uh, studying mammals, and these are two species I happened to name um, some 15, 20 years ago. Um, both of them uh, will be lucky to see out the century if current climate trends continue, because uh, they live high in the mountains of New Guinea, their alpine ecosystems are starting to contract, and those species will become extinct uh, by 2100, simply because there won't be any climatic conditions to suit them on those mountains um, by the end of the century. Uh, that's just one example. As I said, every ecosystem on the planet is being affected by climate change. Uh, sea level rise is another major threat. Uh, global food security, another major problem. 
We've come to a agreement as to how to deal with this problem rather late in the day. In Paris, in 2015, we finally got that political agreement that is now starting to drive change. Um, I say it's late in the day for reasons I'll come back to uh, a, a bit later. It's a very, very good thing to have and it's already starting to, to, to have an impact. But it's come late and it will be a very hard road now to avoid a significant uh, uh, climate change. One of the great things that's come out of Paris is the continuing uh, expansion of the clean energy sector. So if you just look at solar, large-scale solar in Australia, the cost of large-scale solar has dropped by 30% in Australia in the last six months as we've seen increased deployment. So the energy that retailers who have solar plants sell now to, to industry and to, to communities costs about $60 a megawatt from these large-scale solar plants. Um, that's down from $90 uh, some years ago. So they're getting very, very cost competitive with, with fossil fuels. You can't build uh, fossil fuel plants for um, half of that. But we still have this problem of the vast volume of greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere and causing climate change. This is a, a bit of a, a model of the, the, the carbon budget. You can see here's all of those barrels of oil coming out of the Earth's crust, going into the atmosphere. We've got more greenhouse gases coming from agriculture and from burning of forests here. We have a land sink here and an ocean sink that takes some of that stuff back, some of the greenhouse gases back, but quite a lot of it, about half, remains in the atmosphere. We can use that carbon budget to try to work out um, what our chances are of staying within two degrees of warming. And the latest research suggests that, in fact, we're already out of carbon budget. Uh, that, that if we just let things go now, um, with the amount of greenhouse gas that's in the air, we will go through the two-degree guardrail eventually. This is bad news, obviously, for humanity, but within every um, piece of bad news, there is also, I think, opportunity. And that's where I want to really focus tonight. It's become very clear that not only do we need to cut greenhouse gas emissions hard and very fast, but we also, over time, need to build up the capacity to get some of the gas out of the air. And there are some very, very interesting ways of doing that. I first became aware of um, these technologies and approaches through uh, the man on, the, on your left there, Richard Branson. I got a phone call when I was in Sydney about a decade ago from this guy who just said, hello, it's Richard. And I said, oh, hello, Richard. Wasn't quite sure which Richard it was. And he said, well, would you come to my island and talk to my people? I said, oh, yes, sure. So uh, he flew me on an airline that won't be named, of course, I'm first class all the way across the world. And I talked to his uh, people. But at the end of that talk, he, uh, he said, look, I, I don't think humans are going to rise to this challenge fast enough. He said, I'd like to develop a bit of a backup plan. And his backup plan was this thing called the Virgin Earth Challenge. Al Gore is one of the judges on it, I'm another. The Earth Challenge prize of 25 million pounds will be given to um, a technology that can take one gigaton of CO2 out of the atmosphere per year. Um, there's been 11,000 entries, there's been incredible innovation, I think, uh, across, uh, across the whole um, sector. And I'll just run through just one of the technologies that I think is a real front runner. Seaweed farming, kelp farming. It's already a really big industry, but um, it's going to grow um, over time. It's already a multi-billion dollar a year industry. Seaweed is fabulous stuff. It grows very fast. It grows 30 to 60 times faster than land-based plants. It can be used for so many uh, purposes, and in fact, I think Pia Winberg is in the audience here, who's one of Australia's leading seaweed researchers associated with this university. She could tell you more about the details than I. But the thing that interests me about it is that because of its rapid rate of growth, it can capture large volumes of carbon, large enough to make a difference uh, to the problems that we face. You might think that we'd be able to draw enough carbon out of the atmosphere to make a difference on land by planting trees, and planting trees is a very good thing to do. But to take out one-tenth of the carbon we put in every year, we'd need to plant an area about the size of the United States with forest. That's how big the problem is. We need something bigger than the continental US to deal with that, and that bigger area 
is the world's oceans. There's 71% of the world's uh, surface is oceans. Um, and these areas with a very fast growing plant like uh, kelp, this is where I think we can make a difference. A recent study suggests that mid-ocean kelp farms could do a lot. If 9% of the world's ocean could be covered in seaweed farms, then we could replace all fossil fuel energy from the energy you generate, methane from those, that kelp. You could remove 53 gigatons of CO2 per annum from the atmosphere. That's more than we're putting in every year. We could increase sustainable fish production to provide enough food uh, for a population of 10 billion people, enough protein for a population of 10 billion people. We could reduce ocean acidification and increase primary productivity. When I first came across this study, I thought, fantastic, let's get started on it. And then I thought, well, I better calculate how big 9% of the world's oceans actually is. It's a, it is a large area. It's, a, it's an area about the size of Asia, to be honest with you, four and a half times the size of Australia. So uh, I don't think I'm ever going to live to see that happen. But even if a small fraction of this could be, um, could be uh, achieved, it will be a huge result. Um, and that in the mid-oceans, um, if we can get nutrients from lower water levels up to the kelp, um, you can just drop the kelp off. It goes into the ocean depths where it's sequestered effectively. It's out of the, it's out of the atmospheric system, sequestered effectively forever as far as, as far as our lifetimes are concerned. So mid-ocean kelp farming might seem like a distant dream, but the very first mid-ocean kelp farms actually being constructed right now off the coast of Indonesia with Australian federal government funding and with intellectual property from Woods Hole Research Institute in the US. It's only about a hectare in area, um, but it's, uh, it's a start. Of course, if we talk about this in a large scale, we have to be aware that ecosystems might be affected. The deep oceans are not devoid of life. They have their own life systems, including these amazing looking squid. As we put lots of kelp into the deep oceans, we need to be aware that there may be, we may trigger changes in those ecosystems. The very first studies on kelp flux into the deep ocean have just been completed this year, earlier this year, so we know more about this as time goes on. I think if you can remove CO2, atmospheric CO2 at those sort of scales, you can think about atmospheric CO2 as a bit like money in the bank. And the reason for that is that the adverse consequences of that burden of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere is going to be felt for many decades ahead unless we can remove it. And the consequences are going to get more severe over time. So I think we will see at some point this century a whole new carbon negative, a whole new carbon negative economy uh, developing which will be required to keep Earth safe from climate change and is certainly achievable by around uh, 2050. And it will involve chemical, biological and probably completely no novel sequestration pathways, um, most of which already exist at least in embryo or in concept stage. I want to turn from kelp now to sunlight. Um, when we think of solar power, most of us think of solar panels. When I think of solar panels, I think of an Edison telephone, you know. This is the very earliest stage of a, a revolution for capturing energy from the sun, which will eventually lead to much more sophisticated approaches. One of those sophisticated approaches is called concentrated solar thermal technology. And I'm just going to spend the rest of my talk looking at the extraordinary um, potential of these technologies. Here we have a CST plant. This one's in South, in South Australia, in Port Augusta. All of that, that field of mirrors is focusing on that glowing head there, and that plant is running a greenhouse that we'll come to uh, in a moment. So salt water going up through that uh, into the head. Concentrated solar thermal technologies can capture and store energy. They can generate high value heat. They can desalinate water. They can help grow food. They can help make new materials. They can clean up polluted soils. Really, if you have high value energy being captured clean from the sun like that, you become a sort of an alchemist. There is a huge number of things that can be done. That um, CST plant that I just showed you before is at Sundrop Farms in Port Augusta. This is their little motto. Um, they produce about 10% uh, of Australia's trussed tomato crop out of 20 hectares of barren desert. How do they do that? They take salt water, they desalinate it through their CST plant to irrigate their, their crop. They use the heat from the CST plant to keep their greenhouses going. Uh, they use electricity for all of their other purposes. So really, they're growing lots of high-quality food uh, 
on nothing but sunlight and salt water. No fossil fuels involved, no fresh water involved. That turns on its head our whole concept of agriculture. Uh, and this is a, a genuine Australian innovation that I think is going to be very important globally into our future. There are other forms of CST technology. This little one here is a modular unit, half megawatt unit, can produce very, very high heat loads. And this one uses sand to capture the heat and to uh, 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 retain that heat at 900 degrees Celsius that can be used for all sorts of purposes. Some forms of CST technology have been harnessed to do incredible things. This particular example here is used to break apart the CO2 molecule and use the carbon in that molecule to grow carbon nanofibers. Amazing. Professor Licht here claims that um, he can um, manufacture carbon fibers cost competitively with current processes using this particular technology. Really, really interesting stuff, I think. I think my time must be running out because the light's gone off. Can't see anyone to tell me. But um, I just want to finish up by, you know, when we talk about these massive technologies, these gigatons of carbon that have to come out of the atmosphere, it can seem overwhelming. Um, but I think if we look back in our history, we can see what we can achieve over a short period of time, over, say, 32 years out to 2050. Think about the world in 1917. That was kind of pretty standard form of transport. And if you were at a school, you would have been taught from a map that looked like that, the old European empires on it. Extra extraordinary antique looking from our perspective, but that sort of map hadn't changed for centuries uh, in 1917. By 1950, there's an average city. You won't see any horses there. It's all, um, it's all motor vehicles. And imagine telling a kid in 1917 in Wollongong about jet aircraft that would exist by the time they were an adult or about an electrified home, or about nuclear weapons. We can't know what 2050 will be like, but we can see that there is a real need for getting CO2 out of the atmosphere in order to stabilise our climate. We are going to be ever more connected, we will be ever more powerful. The rate of change that we'll see this century will dwarf that, I think, of last century. So really, our greatest need is, I think, for some imagination, is for young people to think, I can make a career in this. Maybe this is worth pursuing. Maybe as a young engineer or whoever, we can do something uh, that looks very big, but step by step uh, will transform our economy and our world. So thank you very much. Thank you.